say, a couple entities with the resources to do so uh, will have more access to consumers. Big media companies, like the ones that have consolidated control over the rest of the media, like radio, TV, and publishing, where fewer and fewer companies own more and more. Television, for example, where just six companies control all four of the big networks and a majority of the channels on most cable systems. In a very real way, the antidote to the consolidation in the traditional media was the emergence of the Internet as a place where people could break through those barriers, that consolidation, and gain access to the information, the, the products, the services, the ideas that, uh, that they wanted to have in their lives. And that's where the genius of the Internet was, that it made the First Amendment a living document again for millions of Americans for whom it had lost its meaning. The First Amendment had become what A.J. Liebling famously said, the you know, freedom of the press belongs to those who own one. Well, this basically made freedom of the press belong to everyone again. The fact that it is truly an open environment where the costs are so low, people have a chance to get in there and say something without being censored. Media scholar and reform activist Robert McChesney and his allies in the fight for net neutrality say this openness is so valuable to democracy that we can't afford to let it change. The decisions that we're going to be making in the next two or three or four years are probably going to set our entire communication system and, and really our entire society on a course that it won't be able to change for generations. It will set institutions and rules in place that we're going to build on. Advocates of neutrality worry that the new rules for the Internet are being written by companies that are interested mainly in controlling the cable TV business, which is worth about $100 billion a year. That's because increasingly all television, as well as phone services, will be coming by way of your computer. There's a new world of technology and choice in communications. Last summer, the telecom industry spent millions of dollars on ad campaigns aimed mainly at members of Congress. The telephone and cable companies were battling for new legislation that would lock in their control of TV services offered over the Internet. As soon as Congress updates our telecom laws. These are companies that, without exception, are all based on getting government monopoly licenses, government monopoly franchises for telephone service or cable service in their communities. Their most important work, their, their victory in the marketplace isn't with consumers. In the marketplace, so to speak, is in Washington or it's in state capitals or it's in city hall, getting politicians to give them these monopoly licenses. Cable and phone companies spend millions to get that message across. The cable industry's trade group and top firms, for example, spend around $12 million a year to lobby D.C. lawmakers and to give their campaigns about $5 million per election. Among phone companies, AT&T is the nation's second largest campaign donor. And every year, Verizon spends nearly as much on lobbying as the whole cable industry. One report estimated that this year, the two industries have been spending $1.5 million a week to influence Washington. The unfinished business is the request for a recorded vote on Amendment Number 7, printed in House Report 109-491, offered by the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Markey. In June, that strategy paid off. Even though advocates of net neutrality say it's the First Amendment of the Internet, the House of Representatives refused to reinstate it. The amendment is not agreed to. Those advocates say that if the Senate goes along, it would be one more victory for big media conglomerates. Like what happened with the Telecom Act of 1996, when the Republican Congress and President Clinton gave big media companies the power to get even bigger, to own more and more TV and radio stations. Very powerful lobbies, phone companies, media companies, cable companies, computer companies, were duking it out, basically, to make sure the rules were changed to benefit them. There was a clear understanding then, as there is now, that the government was going to set the rules. There was no such thing as deregulation. Deregulation was a misnomer then as it is now. In other words, McChesney says, deregulation means government and industry cooperated to rig the rules. After the House voted against net neutrality, a bipartisan group mounted an effort to fight for it in the Senate. Every day as more and more citizens learn about the issue of net neutrality, they realize that the Internet as they know it is very much at risk. The idea that brings us together is a free and unfettered Internet for the 21st century.
Republican Olympia Snow came together with Democrat Byron Dorgan to argue for restoring network neutrality. Their plan won support from an eclectic coalition of citizens. The coalition that we have is over 700 groups. So it, there's a huge breadth in its economic and political and faith-based organizations all recognize that having a free and open internet is crucial to being able to work well with their members. Joan Blades is a co-founder of liberal group Move On, and Michelle Combs is director of communications for the Christian Coalition. Our organizations, even though we may not agree on a lot, we are very similar that we are, you know, we try to get our supporters um, out on an issue, we try to activate people, and with net neutrality, we're allowed to do that. Without it, we would not be able to. Last year, there was a bill on the floor, and we realized it, that it was about to become passed where there were some amendments attached to the bill, and we didn't agree with it, and we did an action alert. And within an hour, congressmen were actually changing their votes because they were receiving phone calls and emails from our supporters. So if we didn't have the access of the Internet, we couldn't have sent out our action alert. The public square has been shrinking in the real world in the last couple decades. You, know, you don't have the town square. The mall is your new town square, and the mall is privately owned. You go in there with a political voice, and you can be sent away. Where do you go? Mm -hmm. The Internet has been this bright spot where there's been this vibrant growth of uh, citizen participation. If net neutrality doesn't become law, future move-ons wouldn't happen. Move-on happened seven and a half years ago, a mom-and-pop shop, essentially. We spent $89 and put up a website, and we had equal access to people as anyone else, and it just grew to a half a million people. That won't be able to happen if the Internet is, has a slow lane and a fast lane. And that's what's at risk. Mike McCurry says not to worry. We don't start from the premise that automatically the government ought to get in and try to regulate. We ought to wait and see if there's a problem first. They can't, you know, ask, move on, and Christian coalition. Do you have any problems sending your stuff out today? Uh, the answer is no. They're just worried about a hypothetical problem that has not yet arisen. Now, what representatives of the telephone and cable companies say is, we would never block anything. Do you trust them when they say that? Well, if that's really how they feel, then that's what they should put into the law. That's what the FCC should come out and say, if that's really how they feel. Net neutrality fared better in the Senate, where the Commerce Committee vote on Snow and Dorgan's bill was a tie, leaving the fate of the Internet up for grabs. Neutrality advocates say, without a law, they don't have much faith that phone and cable firms will keep their word. And they worry that government watchdogs will turn into corporate lapdogs. Now the phone companies say, well, you can trust us. You know, we're just out to make money. We're not going to interfere with anyone's political speech. But, you know, the government says that too. We don't trust them. You, you know, you just don't give people that power if you don't have to, and we don't have to. We turn now for some conversation with a man whose work has helped define this debate. Mark Cooper is director of research at the Consumer Federation of America and a fellow at the Stanford Law School Center for Internet and Society. He's been called over 250 times to provide expert testimony to courts, legislatures, and regulatory agencies, yet still has found time to write or edit several books, including this one, Media Ownership and Democracy in the Digital Information Age, and this one, Cable Mergers and Monopolies, Market Power in Digital Media and Communications Networks. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. In the interest of full disclosure, you're not a neutral observer in this story. The Consumer Federation is part of the Save the Internet Coalition fighting for net neutrality, right? Absolutely. So we, what's your dog in this? Well, we, we firmly believe that the principle of non-discriminatory access to communications, open communications network, is vital to our economy and our democracy. So it's not just democracy, it's capitalism you're talking about. Oh, absolutely. If you look back over the history of capitalism, um, the principle of non-discrimination, sometimes called common carriage, has been with us from the beginning. I like to say it's part of the DNA of capitalism because in the capitalist system, the movement of goods and services is vital to economic activity, and the movement of ideas is vital to democracy, and those two go hand in hand. It's not quite David versus Goliath. You've got Yahoo.